All righty, I hear y'all. You want a part two? Well, you got it. Rail cars. Some of us see them every day, and while they can be interesting sometimes, there usually ain't too much going for them. That's because all we're seeing is just average, everyday rolling stock. What about the obscure, experimental, or specialty stuff? The rail cars at the bottom of the iceberg that protect nuclear waste in transit or simply carry plain old air. Get ready to learn all about these and much more as we once again go over 10 obscure rail cars in 10 minutes. Let's start off with Locotrol radio cars, used by Southern, BN, CP, and others in the 60s and 70s. These rebuilt locomotives and boxcars paved the way for DPU technology on today's railroads, and they worked a bit like this. The train's lead engine had a special transmitter on board, and any time the engineer would adjust the throttle or brake, the transmitter would send that information out as radio waves that would be picked up by the receiver car in the middle of the train. The car would then take that radio signal, turn it into MU data, and send those orders to the unmanned locomotives through their MU cables. Several radio car programs died out rather quickly, since railroads opted to put the sending and receiving equipment inside the individual locomotives. But some radio cars, such as Southern's, were used up until the 90s. Speaking of Southern, let's take a look at their top-loaded boxcar used for hauling Kalen Clay out of Georgia. Kalen is a versatile substance primarily used in paper production. While the clay can be shipped in covered hoppers or a slurry mix, Southern wanted a more efficient way to load and unload this product. So these top-loaded boxcars were created around 1963. They could be quickly loaded from the roof like a hopper and quickly unloaded from the side door using a skid steer or tractor. Unloading must be done carefully since Kalen clay is easily contaminated, which is why the boxcars had special liners inside. Ultimately, these boxcars were a huge success, with some reportedly hauling clay into the early 2000s. While I don't think any have been preserved, I wouldn't be surprised if a small museum has one somewhere. On the topic of carrying odd cargo in odd ways, let's check out bromine tank cars, which haul one of the scariest substances out there. Their primary cargo, bromine, is nothing to be messed with. It's a highly reactive, highly volatile halogen that's basically liquid chlorine. These cars are tiny because bromine is incredibly heavy, weighing in at 25 pounds per gallon. And it's incredibly dangerous, so you don't want a lot in one place. Also, these tankers are lead-lined in order to keep the bromine from eating right through their steel shell. And most, if not all, bromine tankers are restricted to a maximum speed of 50 miles an hour. Doe Chemical Company and Great Lakes Chemical Corp are the main users of these little things. And while you can find these tankers on the main line, there's very few of them. And they usually only travel short distances between chemical plants. Last video, we learned about a Goliath caboose. So why don't we learn about some tiny ones this go round? This is a Canadian Pacific Shorty caboose. It measures just 24 feet 10 inches in length, and only two were ever made. Both cabooses started out at a normal length of 35 feet, but were shortened in the mid-40s and put to work on CP's Rosslyn Sub, a line that fed the Kaminko smelter in Trail, British Columbia. However, the Rosslyn Sub was full of switchbacks that limited the length of trains. So by using these tiny cabooses, the railroad could fit just one more ore car on trains destined for the smelter. Unfortunately, when the line was cut back, these cabooses were out of a job and were sent to work as shoving platforms in nearby yards. At least one caboose continued to see work until the mid-80s, but after that, their trail goes cold. Speaking of crazy Canadian rail cars, how about we explore Canadian National's distributed braking cars, also known as air repeaters. When it gets cold outside, all of the components of a train's brake line shrink up, creating huge unavoidable air leaks, and the engines can't keep up with this constant loss of air. So instead of using more expensive engines to keep up with the leaks, these modified box cars and shipping containers are used to provide a cheap secondary source of air, keeping the brakes disengaged in cold weather. These cars have a diesel-driven compressor with air reserves on board and automatically turn on either when the temperature gets too cold or when the train's air pressure gets too low. 
While the idea and usage of air cars ain't new, CN seems to utilize them the most out of any modern railroad, sporting about a hundred in total. One thing that railroads love is data, and they collect it using computers. But how was all this data collected before computers existed? That is what the dynamometer car was for. Developed in the early 1830s, these rolling laboratories used a plethora of electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, and pneumatic devices to calculate all sorts of things, such as locomotive performance, weather, track conditions, speed, crew efficiency, and more. What's interesting is that lots of dyno cars had living quarters and a kitchen, because every now and then, dyno crews would accompany trains for days on end in order to gather necessary data. These cars were used well into the 20th century, and some may still be used today, but computers have basically made them obsolete. Thankfully, there are many in preservation all over the world. One thing you won't find in preservation, though, is BN's trough train. Due to BN's locale, they hauled lots of coal, and in an effort to make their trains more efficient, they invented the 280-foot-long trough train in the mid-90s. 23 of these articulated coal trains were made, and they were wildly efficient, hauling nearly 29,000 cubic feet of coal per unit. However, the abrasive coal dust destroyed the sliding surfaces between cars, and due to the sheer amount of weight each trough train carried, cracks started forming in their aluminum frames, with one trough train being ripped in half in the 2000s. Another problem was how niche they were, so repairs were lengthy, costly, and usually required custom parts. As efficient as these monsters were, they were just too prone to failure and too expensive to maintain, so they were all retired by 04 and scrapped over the coming years. On the topic of big hopper cars, how about we look at the one and only Whopper Hopper, the largest covered hopper in the world. This experimental rail car was made in the mid 60s for ACL and was quite innovative. With 135 tons of capacity, this behemoth could haul any bulk commodity that belonged in a hopper car. And for a quick turnaround between loads, it had a self-cleaning system that would leave the stainless steel interior spick and span. All you had to do was attach a water hose to the intake port, open the unloading chutes, and let her rip. Since the Whopper Hopper's debut was a big deal to the railroad, it was christened with champagne the day it entered service. This monster went on to work for SCL and later CSX before being retired in the late 90s. Today, it's in preservation at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. While some cars carry almost anything, there are lots of cars out there that only haul one product, such as hot ingot cars. Based at the Lehigh Heavy Forge, these cars transport huge chunks of red hot steel between forges under a heavily insulated cover. And because the cargo is so heavy, a lot of wheels are required for proper weight distribution. Usually, these cars stay at the Lehigh Heavy Forge, but sometimes they have to travel over the main line to deliver hot steel to other forges in the region. And because their loads are so time sensitive, they're usually transported on the head end of priority intermodals. But if a hot shot intermodal ain't available, a normal train will work just fine, since the insulation in these cars can keep steel red hot for hours on end. Very few of these hot ingot cars exist in the US, and they all hang around Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. For the last car of this video, how about we take a look at something that hadn't even entered service yet. This is the US Navy's latest armored caboose, purpose built for escorting loads of spent nuclear fuel as they travel from shipyards and propulsion facilities to Idaho Falls for disposal. This caboose is 69 foot long, weighs roughly 185,000 pounds, and seems to be equipped with fire imports along the sides. This $10 million rolling bunker will be part of a pre-made train set that utilizes the new Atlas rail car as a means of transporting nuclear waste casks. Inside the caboose, there will be specialized security personnel who will look after nuclear waste while it's in transit. While this ain't the first mega caboose the U.S. government's made, it's definitely the most technologically advanced, as it houses an arsenal of communication and weapon systems. Currently, this caboose is still undergoing testing, but it should be out on the main line sometime next year. Thanks for watching. If y'all enjoyed this video, consider checking out some other ones of mine. Also, maybe pass yourself by the merch shop. Anyways, till next time.